Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another BLM Black Lives Matter book discussion here with Ann Arbor District Library. Um, before we get started and we dive into this month's book, which is The Between by Tanana Reeve Du, um, how about we introduce ourselves? And if you could tell us a little bit about your um, relationship with the horror genre. Do you typically engage with horror movies and books? Do you like it? Et cetera, et cetera. I can start. My name is Marissa. I am in the outreach department at the library, and I love horror <laughs> books, movies, all of it. Give me a give me a jump. Give me a scare. I'm Emily. I am a librarian at AADL, and I dip my toe into horror. I do not like slasher and violence stuff, uh, but I found that in reading, I really enjoy it because I can slide past the stuff that I don't want to spend too much time thinking about. But I love suspense, and I love it when the evil is human, not magic. I'm Beth. And I'm on also on the outreach team. Um, my, well, I guess I kind of dip my toes in it too. I, do, I don't seek it out, but I currently am watching a series that's horror, grotesquery. I don't know if you've seen that. It's it's bad. Um, uh, so, but I, I also, I have to do a lot of covering of my, even with violent stuff. Um, books, I guess I could relate also to what Emily said about um, being able to slide past the yucky part. So yeah, not typically something I choose. Um, I'm Lucy. I am a library tech in the youth department and um, I don't watch a lot of horror just because I got really scared by some movies when I was little and it kind of scarred me. But um, I did read a lot of Stephen King when I was younger. And then I would say in like the last five years or so, I've really enjoyed reading some horror like Stephen Graham Jones, I love, um, and Victor Laval, I've read a lot of his. Um, so kind of like what you were saying, Emily, about when the when the horror comes from something that is human or um, rather than something that's magical. So it's not like my top genre I pick, but I do enjoy it. Um, my name is Elizabeth. I'm a librarian at uh, the library um and I was just running around doing a bunch of yard work so I'm like sweating sorry everyone lovely for the viewers um but I hate horror I am a total scaredy cat I don't watch any horror movies I saw the ring by mistake and I still have nightmares about it and um I do not read horror I do not like it at all um so this was a Definitely, uh, I had to be brave to uh, crack this one open, but I did. So I'm looking forward to talking about it. Yes. And uh, as I may have said before, I'm not sure. My name is Jacob. I'm in the outreach department. I'm a big horror person. I definitely grew up reading Goosebumps and then those very skinny um, teen thrillers with the incredible covers and all the way into adulthood. Um, movies, TV. Um, so it sounds like as a group, we kind of run the whole gambit from not too much horror, no horror to horror. Um, so that will make this discussion really wonderful. I do have to say that, Beth, you might be the only person in the world who I know is watching Grotesquerie. I'm also watching it. I cannot wait to pick your brain. But that's another time. Ew, conversation. ew. I wish you had a stuff like that. Okay. <laughs> um. <laughs> Pick your brain with with words and intellectual yeah. stimulation. <laughs> I get it. All right. So we are here to discuss uh, The Between by Tanana Reeve Du. Um, I will do my best to summarize this book. It's going to be a mess. Um, and, it, and that's just the way the summary is going to go. So our main character, Hilton, is a black man in, the mid, in his early 30s, mid 30s. Um, this is probably set, I want to say like, mid 90s early to mid 90s he is a black man living in um miami his wife day day is set to be the first black woman judge in dade county so um they 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 live in a lovely house and they are of means they have two children um and hilton is beginning to experience 
these dream-like um, moments, if you will. And throughout the course of the book, he is haunted by a white supremacist in these dreams. Now, I don't really like calling them dreams. That doesn't feel completely accurate. But as a group, we will get there and um, kind of talk more about what the between is. Whew. I left out a million things, but I think the, the main points are we're good. So in general, what was your experience reading this book? Um, first, general thoughts. I I I found it engaging. I was interested in what the heck was going on because it was uh, hard to know. Um, and but it did, you know, I was I I was it was a page turner. I, I was definitely reading it um to find out what how it was gonna end. <clears throat> I was um nervous, of course, because I wasn't sure how scary it was going to be. Um, but similar to Beth, I was engaged pretty quickly. I thought the writing was compelling and the style of the writing was compelling. I also was pretty initially confused. I'm the kind of person who likes to like understand exactly what's happening. And I think the premise of this is we don't really, you know, and that's kind of the point, but I was struggling to figure out how much I should get, you know, if that makes sense. Um, but yeah, I mean, I was, I was pretty much in it right from the start, which is always, that's always a great thing when a book, when a book can do that. I am, um, I have to admit at the beginning of this book, well, I liked that really was engaged with the first part with, um, Hilton and his grandmother, but then when we got into the beginning part of Hilton as an adult, I really struggled with Hilton. I was like, you are a dog. And I, I mean, I think later you see some of why that is. And also, it, you know, it's okay. She can write that character, but it was, it was a struggle for me to get past some of his, um, just like the way he talked about women and observed women, including his wife even. But, um, once I began to understand more about how and why things were happening to him, I realized that like, yeah, you might be feeling a lot of weird anger and stress and all these things because of the craziness that's going on in your life. So, um, it just, it's in the beginning before it was explained to me, I was like, uh Oh, yeah. I think too, uh, just remembering that the book was written in like 93 or 94. I was really grateful that the edition I had began with the author talking about the process of getting her book published because otherwise I think well, I would have realized it was set in that time. I wouldn't have realized it was written in that time. And not to say that you'd give a little more slack to characters, but I do a little bit just because of the way that our sensibilities have evolved over the last two decades. But it was an interesting paced book for me. I was saying, I was talking with Jacob, maybe when I was 50 pages in and saying like, you know, anytime I'm reading it, I'm enjoying reading it, but it's never one where it, I'm always reading multiple books at the same time. And it was not one where I was like, oh, I can't wait to pick up this one again. And then I got about halfway through and I was like, oh, I'm just going to read this book until I'm done with it now because I need to, I, I want to figure this out. Um, but like you, Elizabeth, I I struggle sometimes with knowing like, am I supposed to not know what's going on? Am I, or am I like, did I miss something? Was I reading too fast and not paying attention? And now I've missed this key explanation. Um, but after a little while, I figured actually, you know, the mysteriousness is you're wondering like Hilton is what the heck is happening to this man and what is real and what is fake. And I don't know, I still ended the book with some, some questions on that front. Yeah, I, liked it jacob had read it before me and he warned me that's like <laughs> he was like it is spooky but also it's just like a little bit of a drama and who's into who and <laughs> so that really set the tone for me i'm like this is the first book that i've read by tanana rivdu i'm like maybe a quarter a third into the reformatory which is her most recent book um and that one is like very much like immediately right out the gate like ghosts and so this one is like, took a while to kind of get into where, like, what are we doing, where we are? Like Emily said, I really had to center myself and like, yep, this was published in the 90s. It's very much a product of its time. 
um, which was funny. It was very enjoyable. And it's, I guess, as someone who mostly was raised in the 90s, was like, yes, yeah, this is what it was like. Um, yeah. But I had a lot of fun reading it. And then it felt like there were parts where it was just kind of like going. And then the ending was very quick for me. Like I hit a point and I was like, I need to finish this right now. The ending. Um, I initially read this book a year ago um, to see if it would be a good fit for this um, program, th these book discussions. And it wasn't until I picked it back up this time that the ending really um, settled in with me. But before we get to that, uh, I call this the perfect amount of breadcrumbs where they give me just enough breadcrumbs where I can kind of try to guess what's going on, but they don't give me too many breadcrumbs so I know what's going on. That's where I like to be. Um, I don't, like Elizabeth, I don't like that feeling of being like, now what the hell is this? I want to, give me some crumbs so I have something. Um, Lucy, you had brought up Hilton and struggling to like Hilton. Um, one of my questions I had preparing for this, this discussion is, how did your perception of Hilton change throughout the book? Um, because, and some light spoilers here, Hilton is a, um, I want to say the president or the leader of a notable nonprofit in Miami for recovering drug addicts. The, one of the, our first interactions with Hilton as an adult is he goes to visit one of the women who he had previously helped through the organization and they're flirting and the flirting is like they're you know very white's playing in the background it's it's about to go down um and in that situation he steps away and says or i don't know what he says but he steps away they they don't um come together if you will um when i was reading that i was like just like lucy i said that man is a dog but I will say that my opinion changed um, in some light over the course of reading the book. Did anybody else have that experience? I did, Jacob. I, at first, was, you know, it, it was just, I was kind of like, I rolled my, I was like, really? Like, I don't want to read about this guy. Like, it's just like, I don't, it's not that I can't read books with char main characters I don't like. But, you know, as you said, that was pretty much right off the bat. And I'm like, man, you know, this is just kind of. Like, I'm not, it's not, and I'm not enjoying that, but, um, and I still, um, you know, I'm looking forward to talking more about our feelings at, about the ending and everything, but I think as it, be, as it became more clear, the stress he was under and his reactions to that and uh, why, you know, it becomes more clear kind of why he is a certain way. And I definitely felt ultimate sympathy, really, um, and uh kind of some of that stuff, you know, we'll keep using the word dog, like it almost like faded for me in, in turn, like, if I, was, if I was just like, okay, this is like not the most important part about it, like what's happening to him right now. Um, so I would say my perception definitely changed in that, in that way. And I became less focused on, on that, on the, his more negative aspects, I guess, or I, I understood them better. I think it really helped that it was so clear that he did so much good in his job. Um, because you got that at the beginning too. And so not that doing good balances out bad, but it helped give me more patience with his character that I may have had less of otherwise. Um, and then as you get more context of how he grew up, um, and his relationship with Day Day and how that started and evolved over the years you know as usual as you learn more about a character you get more nuance and then you you tend to have more understanding of them even if you don't necessarily feel like you'd like them to be your friend um but i found myself rooting not necessarily rooting for hilton to always get what he was trying to get but i did find myself rooting that Hilton would be okay in the end versus sometimes when I don't like characters, I'm like, fine, I hope something terrible happens to you mm. and this all pays off. And there was never the point where I was hoping that for Hilton. Yeah. I think my perception of him 
changed. I mean, I wouldn't say I felt warmly towards him, you know, but um, I do think that like one thing that helped me think about it was I realized that I I kind of felt like there were multiple Hiltons and I think in a way there are, you know? And so I realized like, I think what we're seeing there, that's, that's a possibility for Hilton or one sliver of the between or whatever. I don't, you know, Um, but yeah, that he also had a lot of good in him and he was like, generally a good father and he did a lot of good in his work. Um, So yeah, it was just interesting that that was the first, really the first adult interaction that we got with him. Why do you feel like the, um, she felt the need, why do you feel like she opened with that kind of like giving us that? I, I was thinking about that. Like just, I was just curious, you know, what you all thought about like why that was kind of like, cause that's like the first like that's the introduction basically to the character i don't know it was just interesting it was interesting choice for me you mean with his grandma no sorry i meant in his adult life when he's like with the with the you know like flirting with the woman who's like not his wife (laughs) (laughs) i think it was it's it's a way to you know it's like sex sells in one way, I, and that maybe in the perhaps in the '90s, that was really just what you had to do. I mean, the people—it's still like that. But um, and maybe to weave into that uh, the story of where he actually did go there, or did he? You know, you thought that he slept with her, and then and then. I don't know what that was. I mean, it's him. He believes he did. And he believes he left his jacket at this woman's apartment and that they did the nasty and he fell asleep. And, um, and then he, it turned out his jacket was in the closet. So that's where it was kind of like, what is going on? Um, so yeah, I, I was, I thought it was a big dog then, but then it was like, well, What's happening? Once once she the woman was like, I don't know what you're talking about. You know. <clears throat> I think you're totally right about the publishing part of it. Like this was written in what 1995. And so for like a a black author and then like a black female author to be trying to publish a horror novel is just like how, you know, that that's not something that was happening. So I could see why she'd have to like think about putting forth what might sell or be um engaging or enthralling for readers like right off the bat yeah and i think there's something to be said that though he wanted to he didn't um and i don't know maybe to that perspective in the 90s versus the perspective today like maybe he gets more credit for choosing not to and perhaps i would have given him more of that credit if he wasn't like missing the most important ceremony in his wife's career. Like that's honestly, I was more angry about the fact that he wasn't where he needed to be rather than the flirting. Um, right. Yeah. Because so. that, that felt to me like the ultimate betrayal. The, no, that was the part the that, made that was so fun. important. Yeah. And then right. not, yeah. not saying, Oh, I, I need to go. And instead is flirting with this lady. Yeah. I was like, shame, shame, shame on you, Hilton. <laughs> and then and, not long after that it's like because i had tapped it as a mm, i don't like this man because he his wife has just been elected into this position and it mentions how they're both working really long hours and also she's coached this like big elaborate dinner and i'm like mm, mm, okay <laughs> like no oh. shape keeper um but it's such an interesting look at masculinity like from a female author of like because there's hilton and then his other friends Raul, who's started as a therapist, Curtis, who's a cop, who seemed like very like their friends, but also it's kind of like this competition almost. Kurt keeps making jokes about like, when your wife leaves you, like I'm going to get with her. <laughs> and it's just really interesting little like masculinity layered in here that we could just talk about for a whole day. But there's a lot in there. Yes. In in researching for this discussion, 
reading um, interviews with her and, and seeing the author speak on YouTube and stuff, this book was very much written to be published. You know, it's not like I expressed myself and this is the piece of art I came up with. No, Tanana Reeve Du was like, I want to be a published author and I'm going to write a book that will be published. Um, so that plays into it. There's the sex sells thing. I wonder if we're supposed to meant if we're meant to see that Hilton is desirable by women. Um, but the power structure is so effed in that particular thing. It's like this is just super gross. Um oof. Marissa, you had brought up masculine. No, Beth, go ahead. I was just going to say, he shouldn't have been even in that place. I mean, he just should have never been in the apartment. And anyone else in that, in his shoes, would have gotten called on it. And, but again, I think that's more, a lot of the, the 90s thing. It's a lot of, lot, fewer boundaries, you know, but maybe. I don't know. That's what I recall. Uh, Marissa, you had said something about masculinity, and I saw how that weaves throughout the book um, with Raul, Raul's gay brother, Kurt. In what ways did you guys see masculinity, masculinity in general affect the plot and the characters within this book? Well, it's so tied to, to like mental health. Like so much of his advice from his friends are just like, get your stuff together, like get it together, man. But like no real help. No one really wants to talk to him about anything. Even Raul, which like, obviously there's a weird relationship there because it started as his therapist. They've not his therapist anymore, just friends. And he's like, but I need you to be my therapist again. Let me immediately cross that boundary. Refuse to listen to you when you're recommending a different doctor. It's just like there's these weird friends, but they don't seem that deep. Like he's not actually getting any support when he's needing it. In a way. Aside I'm, from like practical, let me run a background check on this guy. <laughs> I completely agree. And I actually thought masculinity was like one of the kind of like main themes in the book that it was almost like a, somewhat of a commentary on that. And I think... um I thought that was a choice that um, he's really Hilton's really struggling. And I think that's even true from what I understand today, that often like especially especially men, if they're going through a hard time, often do not find fellow men particularly supportive and often they don't want to, you know, talk about, you know, get real deep and, you know, really assist and go through the hard things with one another. Um and I, I thought that, that was a choice by the author to kind of show that throughout the book. And um, I, that was very interesting to me. And I, I thought um, those friendships were frustrating, but well, well written. And um, yeah, that was just a component that was good, I thought. Yeah, I agree, Elizabeth. It's like there's this it's like she was showing you this set of rules around male friendship. You know, like we can talk about this. We can go to these sports games sports ball things together and um but like beyond that like we can't go outside these rules unless of course we are in like a therapist patient relationship but um yeah it's it's frustrating i mean you know like it's it's probably real but it's also just like ah somebody you know help him well and even in the ther he had his success in therapy when he was hypnotized like it took that much one more step of feeling free to express emotions um i was thinking about too the choice of the the author who is a woman to write as have her protagonist be male um and i'd be curious to talk to more men to find out if they felt like she did a good job. Like I think about, I I sometimes get very surprised when I read a book by a man who like writes women really accurately. Um, and I wonder how that would be taken from the other side. But I also think about like, is this like how was books for kids for a while where like boys wouldn't read books where girls were main characters? Like, is this in horror? They wanted men to read the book. And so it needed to have a, a male protagonist, um, especially if she's writing the book to to write the book and have it be sold. I could see you stacking it that way. But then it is interesting, like you said, Elizabeth, with masculinity being such a big piece of it, like he 
he was more than just like the tool so that men would read the book. Like it, it was, it was deeply explored, um, especially the stubbornness, I think, and the unwillingness to allow others to help carry the load you're carrying. And his response to feeling scared, a new emotion is like the very hyper masculine, let me get a gun and a guard dog and like patrol my house at night. Like it was very like, you know, aggressively masculine in a way. Yeah, it was beyond. It was like not just masculine from, I mean, I, I think he was feeling like he needed to protect his family and his home. So that part was masculine, but he was very unhinged at that point. And he was also turning that aggression, like the aggression of getting a gun and training this dog, like then started like turning it towards his family, you know, like, yeah. I mean, you know, like hitting his son essentially, right? Like when he goes outside, when he's, it's just, you know, and I think it's a good indication of like the fact that something has really shifted for this guy, but it's also, um, yeah, again, I think it's all part of that exploration of masculinity and even with charles ray who is the white supremacist who is hunting and and and, and um terrorizing hilton in real life and in his dreams their interactions were also very much tainted by masculinity charles ray was always verbally trying to get one up on him they were in competition i think about when they were they were in competition when they're in the gas station, he's like, oh, you got a gun? You can't shoot me, though, can you? That really sucks. Well, I'll, I survived again. See you next time. It was taunting in this very masculine way. Um, I also know that it's like she's a big fan of horror herself. And to me, it kind of also was like not a direct callback, but like obviously I'm sure it was colored by like The Shining and other horror things where it's like yeah, there's like a ghost or like, yeah, there's Charles Ray as like a villain, but really kind of the villain is himself. And like the violence becomes, I guess like the protector is uh, enacting violence against his own family intentionally or unintentionally. It has his like mental health declines. The impact is to his own family who he's trying to protect. Getting in his own way. Yeah. Uh, something that frightened me, I, and I, I might even say which frightened me the most about reading this book, is uh, him not being able to sleep. Um, and this book felt like a long, drawn-out mental breakdown. That which was the source of horror for me. When you were reading this book, did you get scared? And if so, at what points or what 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 brought that fear out? I did not get super scared, which was a relief for me, as we've discussed. Most, but I completely agree that it's felt like a long drawn out mental breakdown. And I think like losing your sanity is like one of the most terrifying things, right? Like not knowing real from fiction or, and, and not being able to sleep, which makes me feel insane anyway. Like, I think if I did... I would say this book unsettled me for sure. And I think if I imagined myself in Hilton's shoes and what like this mental breakdown would feel like, that's when I was the most unsettled. Cause I was just, you know, cause that's, that's what's so scary. I did not necessarily get scared of like, I don't know if that makes sense. Like, you know, some, I don't, and I'm not like laying awake at night, like looking in the corners, you know, from this book, but like, I think, the concept of losing one's mind is terrifying. You know, that, that, yeah. I don't know if we've mentioned that, or did we yet, that he, they'd been getting threatening letters? Maybe you said at the very beginning. But but the th the threatening, you know, threatening the family, and um, that was scary. That's scary to me because that stuff happens a lot. To yeah. elaborate on what Beth is saying, yeah. um, so... His wife, Day Day, is in the process of becoming the first Black female judge in Dade County. And um, as she comes into that role, the family is receiving threatening letters. I'm going to kill you. I'm going to kill your children. Um, 
with more colorful language, of course, but that's what's going on there. Yeah. So that's that's what started the uh, the you know go heading toward a, a unhinged and and then the lack of sleep and then you know the dreams and you know let's talk we do need to talk about the ending but at the beginning there was the uh, memory of his grandmother on the kitchen floor he believed that she was dead. She wasn't breathing. He couldn't. He was a child. He couldn't rouse her. He ran to the neighbors, uh, who he was scared of. But um, he ran down the street and then came back with the man. And then she wasn't. She was a. She was okay. And so that was a mystifier um, in his memory. And I think isn't that seemed to always go back to that that memory. Some of his trauma. Okay, that moment scared the mess out of me too. Just okay. being a child and yes. um, um, having that responsibility of saving your your parent, his parent figure thrust upon you in that moment. And you're a child and you're running down the street. You're just yelling for anybody. I was like, uh, I am triggered. Yeah. But Lucy, I think you're fixing to say something. Oh, I was just going to say, um, and like, it's so it's scary too that he has to run to like the scariest person in the neighborhood to get help for it so it's like the whole thing as a child you know it it it's just terrifying so there is that whole like that alone that bit alone could create a lot of you know internal stuff with him forever and then it just gets then it just builds on that but yeah It so what is unsettling. the between? Emily, I'm sorry. It's okay. I was just saying it was unsettling. Like in reading it, I would feel the emotions that Hilton was feeling. And, but there was nothing that like when you set the book aside that you can't, that I couldn't like stop myself from thinking about, which is like some of the scariest books I've read. There are still images where I'm like, oh, it's 2 a.m. I, I I can't let my brain go there. And this this book didn't have that. Which is not a complaint for me, um, but it was something I was prepared for, knowing that we were reading horror. Right. I feel like um, it got to the point, like you did, Emily, where you're uh, like, "Okay, I'm just going to read this one book now." I I did that one weekend. I'm like, "This is going to be my book," and it didn't bother me to read it at night, you know. Um, so, because um, it was. There were just so many questions, too. But we got to talk about the ending or what we perceived to be what the, what it was. Yes. Um, just to put a, a bow on what we're talking about, uh, you know, what is what about this book is scary? I want to tell share this quote with you from the author who says, The horrifying notion that pervades throughout the novel is if each of us creates our own reality, then ultimately we're alone in the world. So something to chew on. I don't know. I don't know if that was this, the horrifying notion that pervaded through the novel for me. But it's always interesting to see what the author says. Now, before we get to the end, no, Lucy. I just want to say, like, another piece of the horror in this book is like the fact that the the letters are extremely racist, and so it's like, and he's being terrorized by a white supremacist. So it's like at the base of it all, there is that, you know, the horror of being black and being the target of a white supremacist so. that had to be said um i regret not saying it earlier in 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 this that it, this book is about the horrors of being um black and being uh preyed upon by a a racist mm -hmm. um before we get to the ending i would love to discuss how everyone imagines what is the between how does the between function? What what the hell is going on there? I had multiple thoughts at multiple points in the book where, because at first I thought the between is when you die and then, but instead of actually dying, you go into a different reality. And so it's like the between life and death. But then it's also like he's also dreaming and going to different realities. Like when he fell asleep at the ball game and his friend didn't have his cap. 
And it's like, now he's in a new timeline or a new reality, new multiverse. So then I was like, okay, so does he have to die? Does he, like, what's the point of going to different realities just if you're sleeping? Like, how does that help you? Is it intentional? <laughs> I don't know. I guess I kind of, like, lost that thread a little bit. Or maybe it's just like, who knows? That's just how it works. It's not intentional. It's this nightmare of that you can't control where you're going. Yeah, I thought it was death, like a purgatory kind of thing at first, but then he dies. It seems like he dies in multiple ways. You know, like, does he die in a car accident or does he, you know, is, does he drown? And um, so then I was like, well, is it just parallel universes kind of, you know, like what you're saying, Marissa, this sort of switching around in time or, or did he just die in the beginning and imagine the whole thing? I mean, who, who knows? Also, I don't know if this is intentional because I don't know if this was a thought at the time in the 90s, but like the thought of intergenerational trauma of like his grandma died and then came back and saved him. So then he was kind of always cursed if he was supposed to die as a kid and then he's still alive. And then is he kind of cursing his kids? Well, they were never supposed to be born. So are they also cursed? <laughs> like, what happens when they die? Well, yeah, and all his stuff starts to really get triggered every year by his birthday. So it's like, like this idea of stealing another year, you know, like who's he, who's he stealing it from this? I don't know. Yeah. For much of it, I was kind of like, all right, he was supposed to die and he didn't die. And so now he keeps dying, but can't die because he's in theory already dead. Um, but then of course, the further you get into this and the more confusing things get, the less clear cut the theories seem. <laughs> Um, there's also, this is a theory that I've heard from, I don't know, the internet. <laughs> like that, yeah, that like, you can't really die, that it just creates a splinter universe. And so this is kind of a proto version of that, which I thought was super interesting. And then also, I know in an interview with her, the author, she was talking about how being Black feels like being in an alternate reality, that you're just living in such a different world where you're treated different, your experiences are different. And so it was kind of meant to be a metaphor of the whole Black experience that Hilton mm. is trapped in these alternate realities. Hmm. Okay. That <sighs> checks out. So much. No, I thought it was like, okay, so his grandma, so basically, <laughs> here we go. So his grandma in Hilton had this ability to travel and that ability lets them see different realities, including realities in which their loved ones die. Mm -hmm. So the grandma, she was like, she like passed out on the ground when he was a child. But because she's a traveler, she was like, no, I'm not going to die because it's my destiny to save Hilton's life when he's drowning in the ocean. So then by force, she comes back and is like, she, like she's like an evil, weird, like half dead person for like the rest of her life because she's haunted by the, the powers that be are pissed off when you cheat death. So then she saves his life um, and he has that same power and he, he knows, but he doesn't know, or he's able to see in some small way that his children's lives are in danger from Charles Ray. So he's like, in the same way that his grandmother did, he's going to trade his life for his children's life, which is just like the lady who he learns about through the gay brother who went into the house. You see? Yeah. <laughs> it, I feel like I'm the person with the images tied with, yeah, with yarn and thumbtacks. And I'm like, and this is where, and this is how. But, well, yeah, what, what ex except for that, tie in what what you were just describing about how his ability and that he knew he had to save the kids that's that kind of i was able to settle on that after doing some reading too afterwards but how is it like the oh the lady that the gay brother was talking about how she walked into a fire a house fire oh yeah 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. Off the balcony and, and she, was she went back fire. right right yeah. right 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 yeah, because I mean, then it's not like the guide of like his grandma 
was still kind of guiding him. Like there's the little separate paragraphs with like in italics where it's like, you know, do this. And it's like a hint, but it's kind of implied that like that is Nana watching out for him and trying to help guide him. And she shows up in dreams. And, and then obviously they have like a conversation later in the between somewhere. In and he has that conversation with that guy um, who calls himself a traveler. And then they're like, no, that guy's actually been dead, you know? Um, so, oh, yeah. so now that he's talking to multiple people in the in-between or in the between, or is that like a, yeah, lots of pieces. <sighs> and then also the, like. Yeah. Well, all I was going to say is I think it would make a, an interesting film. I could see it um, as, you know, and especially with the way films are made these days, could there's so many, you know, the CGI and all the possibilities of in special effects in general. But yeah, um, the storyline though, I think would would make it good. So the ending. Yeah, the ending. Well, like what you what you said is like it. She he had to save his kids, right? So he, he um there was the gift, right? That a friend gave, and then he wasn't it in the trash can, and it blew up, right? So he saved his kids, though. Also, if there's multiple universes, he's alive somewhere. Mm. Maybe. <laughs> because then he like has a moment after that where he's thinking about stuff but you know what was interesting yeah. to me about that ending moment is that I kind of had this moment this thing of like he was right because he kept I feel like if there's so much of this book where he just is so in doubt of what the reality is and what's going on and people are like that's not what happened you know why are you thinking that and he was convinced that there was something in that package and when you're reading it you're like I don't know this is another you know but then he was right. So uh, at least like he got that. And that's really weird to say, but I was like, okay, he was on the right track that time. It wasn't a great track, but you know, um, it was just, I don't know. It just was interesting to me that he, that that wasn't something that was like part of his, a different reality or his imagined world or his dreams or anything. Well, because grandma told him, or Nana, she told him it was going to be a bomb, basically, I think. But yeah, I mean, because I had the same thought about where he, there's this whole list of people that his wife had prosecuted, and he's just like, no, it's this guy. It's Charles, Charles Ray, or whatever. But it's like, oh, there's a long, lot of names, and it's really just some guy. <laughs> Well, and there was that point towards, you're getting towards the end, and it's like, everything seems to be working out fine. And of course, this is a book for adults, so you're already like, mm, I, I don't think everything's going to work out this fine. But then you look and see like, oh, there's too much book left for this to all be okay. But I think that like knowing how much book is left, like sometimes I'm glad to know it. And sometimes I, I'm i glad when like my ebook tricks me and there's actually like... 40 pages of the next book at the end because it was a similar thing where then we're getting towards the end and that's when the gift and normally if that had happened earlier in the book I'd be like uh I don't know man you've been wrong a lot um you're just messing up this good situation you have yet again um but you see how much is left in the book and you're like oh that present really is a bomb um and I think I really liked that because it was the first time where I was not questioning what Hilton was experiencing and thinking. Like at that point, I was like, no, just narratively, this has to be true now. And so I was like more in it with him than I think I was at any other point in the book um, because it felt like the stakes had to be more real. I wanted to ask about the very end, though, where... Hilton feels a sharp sting in his palm and opens it with a start. And he's got this pen in his, his hand, the, the wing staff with two serpents wrapped around it. And a dear playmate gave him this pen. 
no more than a playmate, someone he loves. Who was, who gave him the pin? I could keep reading if you want. He cannot oh. remember her name or her face, not yet, because this is something that only comes with time, but he knows with certainty that she is a very great woman, a famous healer who he once, he knew once long ago. Ah, it's his daughter. I know, and that's weird because it's oh, like- The daughter gave him the pin? Yeah, she gives him the pin when she's like his young daughter, but then he, after he- dies then he's now looking back on a time when she's older that's like well i think right? it, yes and it gives you the reader like i think m most parents maybe all parents would be like that in losing their life to save their child that that alone was worth it to them but as the reader like and you learn about and the like the premonition that her daughter had for like figuring something out with T cells and helping with a, like that's such big, important work. And so to see that not only was Hilton's sacrifice a parental sacrifice, but it was also his sacrifice that expounded and through making it so that his daughter could grow up and do her work likely saved many more lives than just his children. I, I, I was so satisfied with that ending because it felt like such a redemption for Hilton. Uh, this guy who did intend to help people all along like that helping, helping folks was his, his calling at least in work. And we saw him go sideways so often personally, like how, how redemptive to have his, his ending be not only helping his family, but helping people who really needed it. Oh my, I'm having a, a, oh my gosh moment. I didn't, that didn't click for me until you read it out loud, Beth. Oh, like, okay. Ah, I, nice. I did, I remember when I did read it, I was like, I, it occurred to me, was it the daughter? But then I started looking through the pin, the pin. I don't remember. So thank, yes. Okay, now, now it really makes sense that he was somewhere, the spirit was, or whatever he was, was remembering his daughter, who's a woman. Yeah. So um, time had passed. Mm. Right. Well, guys, I have to be honest. I was nervous. I was with writing the questions I was going to ask you the discussion. I'm like, man, I really hope we can fill the hour. But of course we could. And of course we did. Um, I think one thing that we really haven't been able to discuss and we won't within these next 10 minutes is the one of the biggest things of the book, which is racism. Also, how this book sits in the canon of Black horror. Um, but maybe a question I can ask that will start to chip away at, 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 at that is this book was originally published in 1995, um, but it was reissued in 2021. In fact, this cover and this whole thing that we're looking at here is the 2021 reprint. What does this book have to do with, with current times and why do you think it was reissued um, when it was? There's something about Black horror. Like that's been, not to say that it hasn't existed or that this, was, this wasn't the first and it's not like we're only just talking about it now, but it's certainly gotten a more mainstream um renaissance in you know i to me i think what put it on my my level was when get out came out but then it is it, more and more people are facing horrors in their lives whether it's the horrors that f folks always were facing that now sheltered white people like me were starting to become more aware of i think that learning about those things and experiencing as much as you do experience vicariously through art. Um, we were ready for it in some senses then. So I, it's not at all surprising to see that there were re issues and looking for more, especially like in uh, the publishing industry, there was a lot of like, Ooh, uh, we, we need to start looking for some other stories. Cause we're sure sharing a lot from these white people. And it turns out people are noticing this now. So I'm sure there's some of that too, like even publishers looking to see like, well, what's in our back catalog that we can pull forward. But it is interesting to think about like, why was this one chosen? And I think that's like, even though we've discussed about how it 
feels, you know, it, it's still a product of its time in the 90s. Like, there were just not a whole lot of that 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 distracted from it. And they weren't the main parts of the story. Like, mm-hmm. you could, the author, if she wanted to, which I wouldn't want her to, but if she wanted to, she could do some very light rewriting to make it be uh, in, set in present time. So it still feels relevant. Um but I'm glad because otherwise, like, we wouldn't be talking about it today if it was just some book that came out in 1995. Uh, I think all of us re- read that reissued 2021 version. Yeah, and it's, it it did. I mean, she talks about this in the introduction, but I think it was like April that she wrote her introduction, April 2021. So um, this is a book where anti-Black racism is like the main, the horror Right. And then she's writing it after January 6th. She's or she's it's being reissued, you know, like after January 6th, after like in the wake of George Floyd and all. It's just like the the time it, like it's there's the horror of the fact that this this book is still nothing's changed, you know. Relevant. Yeah. Um, yeah, so yeah. It's yeah. Really an, an interesting thing about it. There's one thing I had highlighted from the beginning that um, sums up it nicely. It says, um, in the between, racism is the monster too. It's a story of a near-death experience gone wrong, but the vessel of antagonism is a white supremacist. Um, And then there was an interview that I read with her about, like, if you were writing it today, what would you change? (laughs) Um, Which is so fascinating because there's so many weird little bits in here that, like, to a modern reader, maybe catch your eye of like where he's meeting the gay brother. And he's like, oh, a gay man, like this is fine. And I'm sure at the time it was like, that's progressive that he doesn't immediately like hate this person. <laughs> but like now it's like that didn't even need to come up because he's just a guy and they have lunch. Um, <laughs> but she was saying like, that's easily something that could be changed. Um, but those are all such minor little things in the landscape of like how things have changed. Like our gun culture has progressed drastically um but the thing that she specifically called attention to which is so interesting is that when she wrote it day day is a public um or she's a judge and a prosecutor and then if she was writing it today she would have made her a public defender in light of everything with mass incarceration um because she wanted day day to be aspirational and she doesn't want people to become prosecutors or judges in the system that is perpetuating white supremacy that's so powerful that like that is the thing that she's really focused on yeah that that speaks volumes i thought it was interesting too that she would have changed her profession yeah i was i was gonna just comment super quickly that i think you know while this book is fiction i think it's a very useful way to convey real horrors, you know, that black people experience through because of racism. And I think the harassment by the white supremacist, that it's sad to say, but like that part was never unbelievable. You know, like that part was not the part of the book that I was like confused about or like begged questioning, you know? And I think, um, that really speaks volumes. And I think Black horror that focuses on the repercussions of racism is a, still a very useful, even though it's fiction, is a very useful way to convey, um, you know, real lived experiences. Well said. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, there's so much more to say about this book, which is really exciting. But we are coming up on the hour here. Um, does anybody have, like, For example, if you like this, check out this type of suggestion. Or maybe just talk a little bit about what you were enjoying during the spooky Halloween season. I don't. But would you recommend it? It reminded me a little bit of The Changeling by Victor Laval. Not the TV show, but the book. Just because that deals with the same kind of like... um, unreality i guess is that you know like you don't really know what is going on or who is um 
like you know what the bigger horror is but you don't know where what how it's coming through um so i just got the same feeling when i was reading this that i got from that book the reading this or re-examining it again um brought to mind um uh, other the black horror genre in general and there's a movie called eve's bayou that i think is like criminally underwatched and like criminally underseen and it might people might not even say it's a horror movie but uh this is me just shouting out eve's bayou um i vaguely remember when that came out but i don't i don't think i saw it but yeah it, it reminded me of the parts of when he's a child and it's very that that movie is from a child's perspective um but I wouldn't watch it for spooky season. I don't know. Watch whatever you want to watch for spooky season. Watch Halloween Town or, you know, Hallmark movie, Halloween wedding. Do whatever you want. <laughs> um, like, Lucy, I also, like, really thought, yeah, The Changeling, just for vibes alone, I really liked that book. Um, and then another one that I have a little bit mixed feelings about, but I had to I had to look it up. It's called Lakewood um, by Megan Giddings. Yeah, I read that um, one. And I, too. it it was, it's more about like the horrors of capitalism and the medical industry. And essentially it's a woman who gets a really well-paying job as a test subject. Um, and also similarly gaslighty, what is reality? Hmm. What's happening? Vibes. Um, it's Thank not you. super scary, I wouldn't say. Um Uh oh oh no oh oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Uh. <laughs> it's uh when you get frozen okay, okay. oh there oh. you are you were frozen but you're back wait oh okay <laughs> now you're it's now a funny moment well, right. at this time, <laughs> it is been you such brought a up treat. Lakewood because it it now that you're saying Lakewood, I am thinking yes, I do get the same kind of feeling. Well, guys, it really has been such a treat to discuss this book with you guys. It's always so fun to do this. Um, so thank you guys, and thank you for all who are watching. Um, we hope you check out the Between by Tanani Tanana Reeve Do and enjoy the spooky Halloween season.